Hi, I'm Daryl Mark. Thanks for joining me on this podcast on iGrow.org. Today what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time talking about uh, government reports. Now, when you're dealing with agricultural commodity markets and all the information that you're getting on a weekly basis or on a daily basis or even an hourly basis, it seems like it's really influenced a lot by the information that coming out of these uh, reports that are issued by the United States Department of Agriculture or in some cases other um, agricultural ministries or departments in other countries around the world. I just want to highlight a few of the things uh, in some of the key reports that we follow here in, in the Midwest uh, with respect to the grain and livestock markets and and maybe try to help you think about why they're important or how they actually end up influencing the market. So as we get started, uh, maybe first off, we're going to spend just a little bit of time looking at some things that you probably remember back uh, from Econ 201 there when you took that at South Dakota State and, and learned about supply and demand curves. And, and of course, looking at this graph here on this slide, that's what a supply and demand curve looks like when you look at it in the textbook, an upward sloping supply curve, a downward sloping demand curve. So in other words, the, the more the higher price levels are, the more quantities people are willing to produce as farmers, for example, but the less consumers are willing to buy um, as, uh, as price levels go up. And, and so it's, it, there's a, a lot of theory, of course, behind that. I don't really want to spend some time talking about uh, that because you can remember that from maybe from your college class. But what I want to uh, point out here is that in the real world, things aren't nearly that simple as to look at uh, that supply and demand curve. In fact, as economists or as market participants, what we really have is a graph that looks something like this one. You have all these price quantity points on a graph, and somehow or another, we try to trace out where that supply and demand curve is. Now, one of the things that economists do spend some time doing is trying to understand what that supply and demand curve looks like. Does it look like, for example, the ones that I've drawn through these intersections of all these price quantity uh, dots here? And, and uh, it, they could be like this, they could be more up and down, or they could be even more vertical too. It depends on the elasticity of supply and elasticity of demand and all those sorts of things. But one of the things that, the reasons that I bring this up is because it really underscores the difficulty of trying to understand whether you're experiencing a, um, a shift in the supply or demand curve or a movement along one of those curves when you see quantities change or price levels change. And by that I mean, think about this, a supply curve shift, for example, um, to uh, the purple S1 line here, or an increase in supply to the purple S2 line from that original green supply curve is either a decrease or an increase in the supply schedule, or in other words, in the overall supply. We also have a movement along the original supply curve, which could be uh, really considered no change in supply, it's a change in quantity supplied, and there's a key difference between those. Um, the, the key thing to remember there when you're looking at um, a set of points that just look like this is we're trying to figure out whether we're moving along that supply curve or conversely the demand curve, or whether we're looking at a shift in one of these two curves. It has everything to do with trying to predict where price levels are going by knowing whether you're looking at movements along those curves or shifts in those curves. Um, the things that change supply are input prices, technology, returns to competing products, uh, prices of joint products, and changes in the amount of risk. So you think about that, and, and production agriculture is an easy one to see a lot of these things. For example, uh, farmers tend to increase the amount of production, corn and soybeans, for example, as they have more technology, as we've seen hybrid seed come about, as we've seen the triple stack varieties and, and all those other technologies that we use in, in corn and soybean production, it's essentially increased our yield per bushel and that's ended up increasing supply. Input prices, however, tend to move the opposite with supply. When we're thinking about higher input prices, if it costs more to grow a crop, we're going to see a decrease in supply if you hold everything else constant. There's, there's other things, of course, that, um, that influence changes in supply as well, including the return to competing products. For example, your supply of soybeans will go down if the profitability uh, of growing corn increases. So, so they're related in, in those uh, sorts of things as well. Price of joint products also has, a, has an impact. Um, for example, picture the soybean meal market and the soybean oil market. Both are produced in fixed proportions uh, from a bushel of soybeans. If the price of soybean meal suddenly skyrockets, you're going to have an increase in supply of soybean oil. Not necessarily an increase in the price of that, but an increase in supply because the, the joint production of the soybean meal is, is going to change uh, and increase, uh, increase there. 
changes in the amount of risk have a big impact, I think, on, on supply. And, uh, and it's important to think about that as well, too, because it's increased so much in agriculture, as we've seen increased in capital uh, requirements for um, production, both on the livestock side and on the crop side. The more risk and the more volatility we are, the um, less willing we are to supply at any given price. So one of the things that I want you to note here when I talk about changes of supply, and again, that's shifts in those supply curves, what you're not seeing there is a change in the price of the good itself. A change in the price of the good itself is really a movement along that supply curve. It's not a shift in the supply curve. And, and again, that's important because it, it gives us a gauge as far as whether price levels are increasing or decreasing. Now let's go back to that same slide again, and I've drawn in my theoretical supply and demand curves with all these empirical dots, all these empirical relationships that we see between prices and quantities. And now let's think about the demand curve. Demand curves can shift outwards, for example, um, as evidenced by this, uh, as by this move uh, from D to D1, the, the red line, or it can decrease, uh, as you see, to the, uh, the downward left shift. Or you can also have a movement along that original demand curve. Again, not easy to trace out when you're just looking at a series of dots that look like this, but, but certainly it's important in terms of trying to forecast where price levels are going. Now when you think about things that can change the, pri the price of a commodity in, in terms of changing the demand of the, uh, for the commodity, these are the things that will tend to shift the demand curve, either outward to the right or inward to the left. Prices and availability of other commodities tends to be uh, quite important for that. For example, um, picture a consumer that um, is in the grocery store and making a choice between purchasing uh, pork or beef. If the price of pork is very high, they may buy less of that commodity, but increase the uh, demand for beef in, in that uh, particular case. So the prices of other commodities tend to influence uh, demand for a particular good. Consumer tastes and preferences are a big one, and, and we've seen that so much over the years in, in uh, the uh, protein market, especially in beef. For example, um, uh, here a few years back when the high protein diets were, were very much uh, trendy and, and found consumer preference, we, uh, we saw big increases in the demand for products like beef and pork and eggs and, and less in uh, products like uh, flour and, and other wheat goods. So those things have a ch uh, change in the impact on demand. Consumer income has a big impact as well on those shifts in, in uh, demand. Basically, the more disposable income a consumer has, the more he or she is likely to pay for a particular product. And at any given uh, at any given uh, quantity level, and so that tends to increase or decrease the, um, the demand for a product. Note here again that one of the things that's not listed on this, uh, on this slide in terms of things that change demand is the price of the good itself. Again, that's a movement along an existing demand curve, not one of the um, things that tend to shift the demand curve. Okay, so now let's come back to the original subject, having had that little quick review on supply and demand um, back, from, back from your college classes there. So one of the ways we try to figure out where these points are, these plots uh, of these, in this price quantity space, is the information that's provided in some of these government reports. Now there's a variety of industry reports out there too. I'm just concentrating on some government ones here because they tend to be some of the most widely used and read and, and well-respected ones out there. And, and so the information that we see in these reports mostly gives us information about quantity. In other words, are we looking at higher quantities or are we looking at lower quantities um, over this time, uh, over a particular uh, growing season, for example, or, or whatnot. So really what we're trying to do is get an idea of, of uh, if we're looking at quantities that are maybe in this area or maybe ones that are farther out, bigger quantities or smaller quantities. With that information and historical relationships, we, we then go back to trying to plot, to plot out where these supply curves might be and where these demand curves might be. So, so that's where we're headed with this. Now, when we think about some of the government reports that we pay a lot of attention to if you're in the crop or livestock business, here in South Dakota or other Midwest states, we tend to think about some of these reports. The cattle inventory report, that comes out in January and July. 
The cattle on feed report is another USDA report that comes out monthly, typically on Friday afternoons at about 2 o'clock uh, central time. The hogs and pigs report is a quarterly report that, uh, that uh, is released again by USDA, usually on Friday afternoons. On the grain side, one of the, the key ones that, um, that the market focuses on, both here in the United States and around the world, is the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates. We often call that the WASD report. And you'll note that I often write about that on the iGrow website, uh, the results of those uh, WASD estimates that come out. Um, and those reports are released at about 7.30 in the morning central time, um, typically towards the beginning of the month, usually roughly between about the 5th and the 12th of the month or so. The quarterly grain stocks reports, another report that uh, is released that provides information about how many uh, bushels of corn and soybeans and wheat and other commodities are being held in both commercial and non-commercial or farmer storage. So it gives us a little bit of an estimate of what kind of supply is still available out there for, uh, for buyers. One of the reports that we focus on a lot in oh, February and March is the, and April is the prospective plannings report. That report comes out on March 31st each year and gives us the first survey-based estimate from USDA of what farmers are intending to grow for the year. So oftentimes, for example, in 2012, you're, you're hearing a lot of talk about um, 94 million acres of corn is forecasted. The first survey-based estimate we're going to see will be on March 31st this year um, in 2012 and, and get an idea of what uh, farmers are planning to actually plant for 2012 production. Granted, these things all tend to change, and, and that's one of the things I want to talk about with respect to these reports. The information changes and is reforecasted and updated on a pretty timely basis in many of these cases. Uh, crop progress and condition is one of those. Crop progress and condition report is actually a weekly uh, um, set of information put together by USDA that updates uh, market participants on what the progress is of growing uh, crops, uh, corn, wheat, soybeans, and a variety of others, as well as their condition, how many of them are rated uh, fair or good or excellent, uh, and so on. So if you're interested in getting a hold of these reports or when they're released, uh, that URL there at the bottom of the uh, slide is one uh, to go to there on the National Agricultural Statistics Service. Um, that's where USDA uh, has their calendar of when those reports are going to be released. And like I said, some of these are weekly, some are monthly, some are quarterly, and some of them are actually annual. Now, one of the things in terms of interpreting what these uh, reports mean is, is trying to figure out what it is uh, that, that's actually influencing the market and the timing associated with that. The report's release is, um, it, the, is well anticipated usually by the market. Typically what you see is industry and academic and other market analysts have expectations of what that report is end up going to say about either supply or demand information. Um, oftentimes this information um, is put together by these market analysts and, and uh, is pretty widely distributed through the national ag media and, and other newswire services. This information is used by traders really around the world uh, to bid prices higher and lower in the futures market. And by doing so, the pre-release estimates are, so to speak, bid into the market price of the particular commodities. Um, so, for example, if all the analysts and all the traders out there are expecting a lower supply, they're going to start bidding prices up even before the market report comes out from USDA. Or if they expect higher demand, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to start bidding up prices in anticipation of a bullish report. Um, conversely, if uh, supply is expected to be higher in an upcoming report or demand to be lower, you're going to see uh, these uh, traders start selling off the market, in other words, driving price levels lower in anticipation of a bearish report. Essentially, the, the largest profits from a trading perspective it, are, are going to come to the, those that initiate that position first. And so the culmination of all this happening on a very large scale basis is to really bid in the pre-release expectations going into those reports. Now you say, well, how, how can you come up with these kind of pre-release expectations? Well, it depends on what, what specific uh, commodity you're talking and what specific um, items you're trying to forecast. But for example, if you're thinking about in the Catalan feed report, for example, um, the marketing's number, well, you can get a forecast of that um, what that monthly marketing figure is going to look like by going back and looking at the previous month's uh, actual slaughter data that's already been released by USDA. So there's a number of different ways we can do that. Uh, 
with all the data that's available out there, as well as our own uh, information about the markets as we uh, see them trade. So when we think about market reactions to reports, we, we again come back to this idea that it's relative to where market prices were bid into uh, the to the market before the report actually came out, what those pre-release expectations were. And we gauge a report by being bullish or bearish relative to what those pre-release expectations were, not necessarily whether supply was in and of itself higher or lower or whether demand was higher or lower in and of itself, but how they compared to the pre-release expectations. A report can be bullish, for example, if the reported supply ends up being higher even if it's higher than where what had been previously forecasted, as long as that supply forecast turns out to be lower than what the traders were expecting going into that report. So even with a higher uh, supply being reported, it can still be bullish if it's measured against expectations that are actually uh, going to, to be uh, higher than where that uh, original supply forecast was.